my name is Tom. I'm a software engineer at LinkedIn, where I work on projects to make sure that our site feels fast for everyone. And that includes people who are in emerging markets, where many people's first time on the web will be through a smartphone. It'll be their only device. And when we talk about web performance, we often talk about an app being fast or slow. But there's no single fast or slow axis. Instead, there are a number of axes along which an app can be fast or slow. And I think if we break these axes into two broad categories, uh, we can talk about them. Uh, first, an app being lightweight. That means that when someone taps a link that goes to your site, they see something instantly. Second, we want a responsive app. We want something that responds instantly any time that you tap or swipe or click, even if the page isn't fully loaded yet. And usually, these two things are intention. Staying fast usually means having a bare minimum of code, having a bare minimum of work happen during that initial render. But staying fast requires being smart about how we update the DOM. And the smarter we want to be, the more code we have to load. So many, many people consider using a virtual DOM library to be the state-of-the-art way to build web applications. Uh, this is an illustration of a virtual DOM user achieving level 19 enlightenment. <laughs> now, the virtual DOM was a revolutionary idea because it prioritized initial render speeds. And I think it's no coincidence that the virtual DOM has become this massively popular idea in the age of the smartphone. Because users expect to see something right away when they tap a link. It's critical that we build apps that start fast. But like with any engineering decision, this comes with trade-offs. For one thing, JSX compiles to JavaScript, which comes with parsing and compiling overhead. And most implementations of the virtual DOM render the component hierarchy synchronously which can lock up lower end devices as your component hierarchy starts to grow. And to maximize initial render performance and to minimize file size, virtual DOM libraries tend to have relatively inefficient updating performance. So it becomes you, the app developer's responsibility to efficiently track state and make sure those updates are optimized. And I want to be clear here. Um, libraries that implement the virtual DOM are fantastic, productive tools. Engineering is all about trade-offs. And these are the trade-offs that the virtual DOM has made. But today, I want to explore an alternative approach to building web applications that leans on new APIs, new capabilities in the browser that didn't exist when the virtual DOM was created, to see if we can try to push the state of the art forward. And most importantly, it's an architecture for what I would consider to be the next generation of the web, ready to take advantage of new low-level capabilities like WebAssembly, web workers, and so on. People used to consider JavaScript a toy language that you couldn't use to get real work done. But no one thinks that anymore. And if there's one thing I want you to take away today, it's that we can stop viewing HTML templating languages as underpowered toys and instead view them as first-class functional programming languages that we can optimize to squeeze the maximum performance out of even low-end smartphones. So today, we're going to explore this idea by focusing on three performance optimizations. Uh, the first one we'll talk about is what I'll call instant templates. So one reason that web developers care a lot about keeping asset sizes down is because larger files, of course, take longer to download. But even on the fastest network, and even coming from a cache, there's still a cost that many developers miss, how long it takes to parse and compile your JavaScript. On many devices, the time that parse and compile take can easily outweigh the cost of downloading those files themselves. And the shift to mobile exacerbates this. JavaScript parse and compile can be up to five times slower on mid-tier mobile devices. So an app that loads relatively quickly on your desktop can suddenly feel really slow when you run it on a cell phone. And this is a problem, because even though JSX looks like HTML, when we build our app, JSX is turned into normal JavaScript with the parse and compile costs that come with it. So one of the recommendations that you'll see to improve the start times of your web application are to ship less JavaScript. But shipping less JavaScript is far easier said than done. How do you ship less JavaScript when even just adding HTML to your web app ultimately gets turned into JavaScript that the browser has to parse and compile? So let's take a look at a different way of doing this. We'll use the open source library that I work on called Glimmer.js uh, and handlebars templates like you see here to, uh, in these examples. But I would ask you to focus on the high-level ideas, not any one particular implementation. 
So the key insight here is that we can treat handlebars as a declarative functional programming language optimized for building and updating the DOM. Think of it more like Elm or ClojureScript than a traditional string-based templating library. Most of Glimmer's code base is the compiler. We move as much of the complexity as we can out of the runtime and into the compiler, meaning less code to download, less work for the browser to do. Now, the Glimmer compiler takes in all of the component templates in your application, it parses them, and it compiles them into something that can run in the browser building and updating your DOM. But what does it compile them into? So JSX, we know, gets turned into JavaScript, but Glimmer compiles templates into bytecode. <laughs> Glimmer bytecode is a binary format that encodes an executable program. Well, similar in idea to virtual machines like the JVM or Microsoft CLR, Glimmer's instruction set is specialized for interoperating between the DOM on the one hand and your application's JavaScript components on the other. So if we look at a decompiled version of this program, we can see the various instructions our templates have compiled into. If you've ever been exposed to assembly language, I hope that this looks somewhat familiar to you. Uh, but our instruction set is designed for this interop between the DOM and components. So after the compiler compiles your templates into bytecode, this binary data is sent to the browser where it is executed on this small virtual machine library. It's a small JavaScript library that knows how to run these programs. And one of the advantages of compiling to bytecode is the file size. So here's the binary output after we've compiled this template with Glimmer. We have some additional JSON metadata you see up there uh, that we produce also. And together, these are, this template compiles to 179 bytes, which is smaller than the compiled output for either JSX or, for example, Angular's AOT compiler. But the important idea is that when you're not constrained to emitting valid JavaScript, you actually have a lot of freedom to design a more compact format, which can be faster to download, which I, I hope is intuitive just by looking at the example here. Um, but we mentioned previously that download time is only part of the equation. Let's talk about parsing and compiling talk, uh, cost. People often think of parsing as being so fast it's essentially free. But the complexity of the language that you're parsing makes a big difference. For example, JSON parses almost 10 times faster than JavaScript because it's a much simpler language. But here's the thing about using pre-compiled binary bytecode. There is no parse. By sending binary data in a format that doesn't require any processing on the client, we can skip the parsing step entirely. Thank you for indulging my keynote effects here. <laughs> Glimmer uses binary data directly with no parse or other intermediate processing step. And you can see this in the excerpt from the Glimmer source code. We initialize a UNT16 array to operate directly on the binary data that we get over the network, no parse step. So here's an artificial benchmark I created to stress test the initial rendering performance. Uh, I wrote a script that downloaded 50 random Wikipedia articles and converted them into both handlebars templates and JSX, one component per article. And I wanted to get the sense of how Glimmer's initial render performance compared on low-end hardware, which is an area where the virtual DOM approach has always excelled at. In fact, it killed us a number. So this is a video of the React and Glimmer versions of the app running side by side. This is running on a uh, hand-me-down Galaxy S3 connected over Wi-Fi, so what you're about to see is CPU bound. So we're still waiting here for both of these. It's going to take about, about 10 seconds per. OK, so the Glimmer one pops up, and then a half second behind it, uh, the React one pops in. Now, I know what you're thinking. That was a horrible demo. <laughs> the Glimmer and the React apps both took way too long to load, and they both finish rendering at about the same time, right? Like, basically indistinguishable. And uh, yeah, maybe it's not a good demo, but actually, I think that this is really impressive because React sets such a high bar. And the fact that Glimmer is competitive on initial render, which, remember, is the thing that, that made virtual DOM stand out in the first place, the fact that we can get close within spitting distance of it, I think, uh, is a good sign. Virtual DOM is all about getting that screen on, on, getting content on screen as fast as possible. So if we can meet or or uh, match or beat that performance, we're already headed in the right direction. So that's the idea behind these instant templates. By moving the complexity into the compiler, we can shrink the size of the runtime. Compiled bytecode is smaller than the equivalent JavaScript to download. And no parse is faster than no parse. So let's talk about number two next, optimized updates. And these are some cases where we can start to not just match 
virtual DOM in performance, but actually start to beat it by default. So remember that loading quickly means being lightweight. And being lightweight usually means making very hard trade-offs. One of the trade-offs of virtual DOM-based libraries, including React, is that being fast by default on initial render is more important than being fast on updating renders. And I want to make it clear here that, again, I agree that this is the right trade-off to make if you have to make it. But one downside of this is that while the initial render is very fast, it's really easy to get into situations where your app starts to feel sluggish. Uh, so there was a really great blog post about diagnosing and fixing issues like this called React is Slow, React is Fast by Francois Zanonoto. Francois doesn't have to be in the audience. No? Well, the name like that, I thought it was possible. Um, Francois says, what makes a React app slow is most of the time useless re-renders of many components. You may have read that the React virtual DOM is very fast. That's true. But in a medium-sized app, a full redraw can easily re-render hundreds of components. Even the fastest virtual DOM templating engine can't make that in less than 16 milliseconds. Uh, the React documentation is very clear about the way to avoid useless re-renders, should component update. It's your job as a developer to check that the props of a component didn't change and skip rendering altogether in that case. So this is just one of the trade-offs, one of the downsides of, of JSX, right? Your render method is this black box that the system can't see into because it's evaluating arbitrary JavaScript. So let's see how adopting a virtual machine architecture allows us to implement additional optimizations that make updates, when needed, extremely fast. So uh, earlier I told you about the Glimmer VM, um, but what I haven't told you is that these are actually two virtual machines in one. And that's because there are fundamentally two types of operations in any DOM rendering engine. There's creating DOM elements that don't exist, and then there's updating DOM elements that do. If the DOM nodes for component already exist, it's hopefully obviously much faster to update those nodes when component state changes instead of just throwing them away and creating wholesale new nodes. So let's imagine a very simple template like this. So as a human, you can look at this and you can instantly recognize that only one part of this template is ever going to change. So how do we give our programs the ability to have that same intuition that we have as humans? So like we discussed earlier, uh, on the right is the bytecode that the Glimmer compiler generates for this template. But that bytecode is only for the initial render. We use a technique called partial evaluation to generate an optimized bytecode only for updates. So let's see how this works. We're, just for a moment, we're all going to pretend that we are the Glimmer VM, and we're going to execute this bytecode. So here's that same program that you just saw on the left. We are representing the sequence of opcodes as rectangles, starting from top to bottom. And we're going to execute each one of these in order. And as we do that, we have a DOM element in the upper right corner that we're going to build together. Okay? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to execute this open element opcode. And it's like, cool. It's going to create a new empty div element. Next, the static adder instruction sets the class attribute to active. So we're going to do that. The next two instructions are not particularly important to understand, but uh, if you're curious, they are pulling data out of JavaScript and pushing it onto the virtual machine stack. Um, but now we get to the really interesting part. So first, the dynamic content opcode is going to do what you probably expect, which is to take the value of first name and add it as a text node to that DOM element that we just created. But in addition to creating the new text node, the dynamic content opcode is also going to tell the VM how to update itself if anything ever changes. And it does this through something that we call the update program. So when we execute the dynamic content opcode, it's also going to add an update dynamic content opcode to the update program. So lastly, we execute the close element opcode, which tells the VM basically this element is done, ready to be put into the DOM. Now, what happens when we detect that the first name property has changed? Instead of running the full append program, all over again, which has opcodes for creating DOM elements that we know already exist, we're going to run the optimized update program that only has to worry about updating the, the dynamic parts of the template. So we run this one opcode, and the program updates. And by, so by generating this specialized update program, we can drastically reduce the amount of work required in many common scenarios. And best of all, by generating the updating program as a byproduct, of executing the initial program, we only need to include one version in the bytecode, saving precious file size. So let's take another look, uh, a demo of this in action. 
Um, so we're going to look at our Wikipedia stress test again, and we're going to make one small change to the source code. So here's our main, uh, our main component, React on the left, Glimmer on the right. And we're going to uh, just add a counter that updates as fast as the browser will let us. So we're going to use set interval with a time timeout of zero. And every time our callback is called, we're just going to increment that counter by one. And then we're going to display that counter using an H1 at the top of the component. So small enough change, right? Let's run that on our uh, Samsung Galaxy S3. So this is uh, React on the left and Glimmer on the right. And I would call this a dramatic difference. <laughs> so again, this is a synthetic benchmark. It's designed to stress test, update performance. It's not supposed to be representative of real apps. It intentionally uses an unreasonable number of components to make small differences appear larger. You can make the React version just as fast as the Glimmer version in a few lines of code. I, I don't want to suggest that's not possible. But at the end of the day, wasteful and slow re-renders are a real problem in many virtual DOM-based apps. Worst of all, they can sneak up on you because there's no obvious point at which they become a performance cliff. They kind of just get slower over time. And given the option, isn't it better just to not have to think about it? Uh, so that's optimized updates with partial evaluation. So we're going to talk about our last item here, which is 60 frames per second incremental rendering. So your browser moves things around the page like any other computer program, frame by frame. For the smoothest feeling experience, you want your browser to draw 60 of these frames per second. Unfortunately, 16 milliseconds isn't a whole lot of time to get any work done. And we spend more than 16 milliseconds at a time on our JavaScript by taking 70 milliseconds, let's say, our users experience jank, that unpleasant, stuttering unresponsiveness. And of course, the most expensive frame is usually the very first one, where we're drawing the whole DOM. So during the initial render, it's common for users to see this, the white rectangle of doom. So this is what we saw in the first Wikipedia stress test, right, where we didn't see anything but a white screen for 10 seconds. Now, the reason for this is that most libraries render your entire component hierarchy synchronously, top to bottom, without letting the browser do anything in between. And that's what you saw both Glimmer and React doing in that demo. But because Glimmer is executing a series of opcodes, what if, instead of doing it all in one batch, we instead broke it up into chunks of work? And then we can let the browser uh, respond to the things that we're doing as we do them, instead of wait, having it wait for the entire thing to finish. So let's look at another uh, Wikipedia demo again. This time, we're going to compare Glimmer to itself. Uh, on the left is normal Glimmer. And on the right, we have modified it to break up the rendering work into chunks. So pay close attention, because it might be hard to tell the difference here. So this is the synchronous implementation of that render loop. Glimmer's VM exposes an interface called an iterator that allows you to execute one operation at a time synchronously. This is the entirety of the incremental rendering implementation. It uses request idle callback to only perform work when the browser has, a, has free uh, CPU capacity available. So by breaking this work up into chunks, we allow the browser to do its work, like draw the DOM and respond to user events every few milliseconds. This keeps our app feeling responsive, smooth, even on older hardware. I just think it's pretty incredible that this massive of a difference in implementation yields such dramatically different results for the user. It's a tiny delta in implementation, and yet look at these results. So that's 60 frames per second incremental rendering. Um, these are the key performance benefits that you get when you start modeling your templating layer as a functional programming language. And what's really exciting is that this is just the future. Because beyond just what we have now, there are so many exciting opportunities created by combining this architecture with low-level APIs coming to the browser, like WebAssembly, shared array buffer, and more. So if any of this sounds interesting to you, I invite you to play around with these ideas in the Glimmer Playground at try.glimmerjs.com. It's got this embedded editor that lets you easily create components and templates. You don't have to install anything. Uh, we have this cool little Easter egg where if you click the pie button in the corner, like the net, you can actually see the compiled output, like what, your, what the binary bytecode your components will compile into. Um, what's exciting to me is that all of the low-level capabilities coming to the browser between the ability to handle binary data, execute tasks and threads, run low-level code with WebAssembly, the line between the browser and the operating system has started to blur. And with these tools at our disposal, we can start to radically rethink how we build for the web. That change might feel scary, but I think it's an amazing opportunity to build apps that are fast enough to reach everyone, no matter where they are on the planet.
So thank you so much for your time today. I hope you're as excited about the future of the web as I am. Thank you very much. Yeah.